remote, beautiful, mysterious, unique. Islands are worlds of their own. Places apart where life has evolved differently. But in our modern interconnected world, islands are also part of a global community that's changing, for better or worse. In this series, we're exploring the lives of islanders. We're discovering that no matter how distant they are from the mainland, how distinctive their histories, or how proud they are of their independence, islands can't separate their futures from the fate of humanity as a whole. In so many ways, these shores are the front line of global change. What happens here matters to us all. In the middle of the North Atlantic, at the edge of the Arctic Circle, lies an island nation on the knife edge of the world. Iceland is one of the most volatile places on Earth. Made by volcanoes spewing out molten rock over millions of years. The Earth is still active. The island is still being created. And living here is a unique challenge. A big country with a tiny population. Huge swathes of the interior are uninhabitable. But in an unforgiving landscape, Icelanders have learned to survive. Instead of farming the barren soil, they harvest the seas. Instead of escaping the wilderness, they're harnessing its power. For centuries, Iceland's physical isolation has shaped and protected its people. They've developed a unique and homogenous culture. Their language is as pure as that of their forefathers, the first Viking settlers. But Iceland's remoteness is no longer a barrier. The outside world has arrived, and it's a world in a state of flux. Economies are changing. Climates are warming. And energy is a commodity that everybody wants. In commerce and in culture, Iceland is already a global player. In a land's land, no one's listening. This far-flung island has the power to make an impact across the whole world. I'm sure in this I believe in. This is the path it chooses will affect us all. Oh my God, I'm losing it. I'm Tradition going or progress. My senses tingle, I can hardly breathe. Nature or industry. The old ways more than you. Iceland is one of the least populated countries on Earth. And one of the wildest. A geological hotspot. Iceland also straddles one of the world's most volatile geological features, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. 
It's a massive tectonic plate boundary, and it splits Iceland in half. As the tectonic plates pull Iceland apart, magma rises to fill the space. It's this volcanic activity that's forged Iceland's bedrock, and its construction is far from over. Today, the island boasts more than 100 volcanoes and more extreme geothermal activity than any country on Earth. Isolated from the outside world, Iceland's volatility usually goes unnoticed, until nature chooses to remind everyone of its awesome power. In April 2010, Iceland's Eyjafjallajökull volcano erupted, bringing Europe to a standstill. Worried that the volcanic ash would cause jet engines to fail, aviation authorities cancelled thousands of international flights. As the costs ran into billions of dollars, the world looked for an explanation. Now, that, of course, the eruption that took place here wasn't big, but it was serious, because it produced so much ash. Haraldura Sigurdsson is a world expert in volcanology, living in one of the most volcanically active regions on Earth. Iceland has been inhabited for more than 1,100 years. People have lived with eruptions and felt their effects. In Iceland, it's so common, people regard it as an everyday thing. Even by Icelandic standards, this eruption was extraordinary. The ash creates new soil, like this layer here. It was because the ash was so fine that it spread out so far across the Atlantic. Due to the combination of steam, explosions in the glacier and gas in the magma, the ash was much finer. That's why this eruption created so many problems. But the effects of this eruption pale in comparison to a cataclysmic explosion that happened here some 200 years ago. These are lava fields at Eltrian. The moss-covered lumps are scars left by the flow of molten rock. The lava spewed from La Cagiga, a tectonic fissure that erupted in 1783, creating one of the biggest volcanic events in history. For eight months, deadly ash and lava engulfed the island, killing a fifth of its population. The ash cloud spread far, plunging the world into darkness and famine. Icelanders still live under constant threat of more deadly eruptions. At least these days, they're better prepared. All movements within the island's volcanoes are monitored. At the first sign of unusual activity, residents are contacted by phone and evacuated to a safe location. No one was killed during Ayevled de Yogurt's recent eruptions. In the shadow of volcanoes, Icelanders have learned to survive. Though the country's interior is so barren, most Icelanders are forced to live on the edge, in coastal towns and cities. Reykjavik is home to nearly 40% of the population. The world's most northern national capital, the city gets just four hours of daily sunlight in winter and almost round-the-clock daylight in summer. 
Reykjavik's natural harbor is the cornerstone of its wealth, a commercial gateway and trading hub for the country's traditional produce. Fish is Iceland's superfood. It's the country's most lucrative export and the one resource that's enabled Icelanders to survive. Over a thousand years ago, when the Viking settlers first landed on Iceland's shores, the forbidding landscape loomed large. Long, dark winters and poor quality soil made it impossible to farm the land. But nourished by the warm Gulf Stream, the fertile waters surrounding Iceland offered a lifeline. The early islanders came to depend on fish to sustain them. They still do. Today, less than 1% of the entire island is cultivated for crops. Fishing is still a major source of income and a way of life. Fly fishing is Christian Davidson's favorite pastime, but he spent his working life in commercial fishing. Born in a small town north of Reykjavik, he learned his trade from his father. Christian remembers anxiously waiting at home with his mum and siblings whilst his dad was away for months, trawling the seas. It can't have been easy having five children in bed and a husband out at sea in all weather and not to know when he was coming back or if he was coming back. It didn't stop Christian wanting to follow in his father's footsteps. I'm trained in fish. I went to maritime college. I did my degree in fishing studies. I've spent my whole working life in fisheries in some way. It was a dangerous choice of career. Because although the North Atlantic waters that surround Iceland are plentiful, they're also wild. Turbulent weather systems collide off the island's coast, causing vicious storms and dangerous swirls. Over centuries, Icelandic sailors have learned to respect the ocean's power and to ask God's help to sail it with a prayer. Iceland's coastline is peppered with churches. Their altars are the last place a sailor would visit before going to sea, and the first place he would visit on his return. But prayers offered no guarantees. So many sailors' graves testify to the Atlantic's brutal force. The sea gives and the sea takes away, as we say in Iceland. Christian joined the fishing industry at a time when cod was king. In 1991, over a million metric tons of fish were caught in Iceland's waters. Reykjavik evolved from rustic town to vibrant export capital. But the world that was buying Iceland's fish was changing. Banks were going global. Technology encouraged the free flow of money between nations. Realizing credit was becoming the new king. Christian became a fisheries expert in the bank's seafood division. Like many bankers, he got rich. We all started taking more holidays abroad, and the bottles in my London wine cellar increased considerably. The economy boomed. Icelanders tasted the good life. 
and became one of the richest nations in the world for a while. Even fishermen benefited from the credit free-for-all. Banks encouraged them to take out loans secured against their personal fish quotas. Fortunes were borrowed on the promise of fish that hadn't yet been caught. Iceland was hooked on credit. But in 2008, the world economy started to wobble. Stock markets plummeted. Iceland's credit tower collapsed. Almost overnight, it was as if we were in the middle of a cloud of ash. The banks had mortgaged Iceland to the hilt. They'd borrowed six times the value of the country's gross domestic product, forcing the government into a bailout. For Christian, the news came on the eve of a big corporate presentation. A week later, the whole banking system in Iceland collapsed, and I was out of a job. Within six months, unemployment rates increased fivefold. Impoverished Icelanders took to the streets. The kitchen revolution became one of the most violent protests in Icelandic history ousting the government that had led them down the path of ruin, the islanders demanded a return to traditional values. Fishing has once again become Iceland's economic lifeline. Real profits from real catches are being used to pay off Iceland's debts. Christian, too, has returned to what he knows best. He started a fishing consultancy company, providing advice to fisheries worldwide. But it's a long road to recovery. The debts we are now responsible for are so big, we can't understand the numbers. What kind of future is there for my children? The more Icelanders engage with the outside world, the more their own world will change. Before the crash, Iceland was at the center of a prosperous global community. Its economic collapse propelled it back into the remote North Atlantic. Luckily, Icelanders have an aptitude for survival. Centuries of living in an ever-shifting wilderness made them resilient. A thousand years of isolation shaped the national character. With no neighbors to call on, Icelanders learned to be self-sufficient. With nowhere to run, they learnt to endure. Iceland's wilderness is changing on a scale the islanders have never seen before. and in ways that are almost impossible to predict. In a land of snow and ice, the effects of global warming are easy to see. The glaciers that cover 11% of Iceland's landmass are melting. Vatna Yogurt is Europe's largest ice cap. 800 meters deep, it covers more than 8,000 square kilometers. 
but it's shrinking at an alarming rate. A hundred years ago, there was no lagoon here, just a sheet of ice 30 meters deep. But as Vatna Yogurt and his outlet glaciers shrink, this lake is filling up fast. A century ago, the glacial tongue reached out to sea. Now, it's retreated by two kilometers. The lagoon left by the shrinking ice has an unearthly beauty. Tourists come to watch this spectacle of global warming happening before their very eyes. But the beauty hides a destructive force. As it extends seawards, this lagoon is threatening to wash away Iceland's main coastal highway. It's a story that's being repeated all over the island. Meltwater and glacial debris are reshaping the landscape. Experts predict that in just a few hundred years, Iceland may have lost all its glaciers. Their retreat will leave behind a very different landscape and climate. What used to fall as snow will fall as rain. The barren earth will become more arable. And sediment washed down from the mountains will transform the coastal ecosystem. As the world warms, Iceland's isolation is melting away. Icelanders are preparing for a very different future, in which the demands of the outside world are a driving force. Many believe it's natural energy that will propel Iceland forward. The landscape is alive with it. It cuts across the earth. It seeps from the ground. Icelanders are world leaders in harnessing its potential. Almost all homes are heated by geothermal energy. but it's glacial rivers that are powering commercial growth. Fast and furious, their potential to generate hydroelectricity is massive, and industrial prospectors are queuing up to harness it. In 2003, aluminium manufacturer Alcoa chose the remote coastal town of Rey da Fruda as a location for a massive smelting factory. This is one of the biggest industrial developments in Iceland's history. At temperatures of 950 degrees Celsius, liquid aluminium is smelted using high-intensity electrical currents. This process requires huge amounts of energy and it's hydropower that supplies it. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In the aluminium plant, they have to keep going round the clock. Hansina Oladotter works in the pot room, where the liquid aluminium is extracted from the powder ore. It's tough manual work but women make up almost a quarter of Fiadarod's total employees. The factory draws its entire 2,000-strong workforce from the local area. It's shift work, the hours are long, but people aren't complaining. 
When people first started talking about building the aluminium plant, we took it as a cause for celebration because employment was falling, job opportunities were drying up, people were moving away. Before the factory opened, Ancina worked in a kindergarten and her husband in a local fish factory. With two teenage children to care for, life was a struggle. My husband never knew what he was getting. His pay was up and down. If trawler catches were poor, there wasn't much fish for processing. So there was sometimes no work in the freezer plants for days on end. Today, her husband, son and daughter all work at the aluminium plant. It has replaced fishing as the main source of income for the community. Producing 940 metric tons of aluminium a day, it also generates huge revenue for the national economy. Iceland has no natural deposits of aluminium ore. The raw material has to be transported thousands of miles to the factory. Electricity here is so cheap, it more than makes up for the expense of shipping. But there is a cost. And it's Iceland's wilderness that's paying the price. Some 50 kilometers east of the smelting plant lies a subterranean powerhouse. 75 kilometers of tunnels direct tons of water per second through gigantic turbines. Two glacial rivers have been dammed and channel to flow through this energy labyrinth. And the hydropower they create all goes to power the smelters. It's a massive engineering operation. And above ground, the scars run deep. This is Kauranuka Dam. Water that powers the aluminium smelter pools here in a reservoir 25 kilometers long. At nearly 200 meters high, the dam wall is the biggest of its kind in Europe and one of the most controversial. The proposal to build the billion dollar project triggered national outrage. Icelanders were appalled that one of Europe's largest unspoiled wildernesses was to be drowned in the name of industry. Protesters camped out at the construction site. They rallied huge international support. But they couldn't stop the march of progress. The dam and the aluminium factory are now a concrete reality, transforming the landscape and transforming lives. Factory work has thrown the community a lifeline, but not all the change is good. Anti-social working hours are having an unexpected impact on domestic life. Shift workers like Hansina are finding it difficult to keep up with friends and family. Those of us who work for Alcoa are sort of lost. We leave here at 7 in the morning and get back 9 o'clock at night. People don't dare phone or visit because they think we're either working or asleep. To make sure they stay in touch, Hansina gives out copies of her work timetable to friends. With the collapse of the banks, if it hadn't been for the aluminium plant, we would probably have gone bankrupt. Now the future is bright. Today, Iceland is attempting a historic balancing act between people and nature, ecology and economy. Building this aluminium factory has set an important precedent for progress. And there's a good argument for building even more smelters as global warming takes effect. 
fed by fast melting glaciers, rivers will see surges in water flow. And their hydropower potential will dramatically increase. It's a great window of opportunity, but it's brief. Experts predict the surge will last 50 years or so, after which it'll fade to almost nothing as the glaciers that feed the rivers dry up. Many believe industrialization isn't Iceland's only option. This is one of the world's most pristine environments. One of the most sparsely populated countries on Earth. Parts of the island are so off the beaten track, they've yet to be named. But the forbidding terrain that's kept humans at bay for so long is now drawing them in. Today, visitors come to be amazed at Iceland's extreme beauty and the creatures that inhabit it. On the northeast coast of Iceland, Husavik is a town that's used to travelers. It was one of the first places settled by seafaring Vikings. For centuries, people here scraped a living from fishing. Long winters brought hard times. So the bigger the catch, the better. It was part of the culture here in former times that people went and got whatever food they could find. Minky whales, dolphins and porpoises. Things are different today. It's not in our interest to hunt whales. Today, Husavik has reinvented itself as the whale-watching capital of Iceland. One man who's tapped into the new tourist market is Stefan Gudmundsson. For 10 years, he's run Gentle Giants, one of Husavik's leading whale-watching companies. Stefan's no stranger to sailing. I started going to sea with my father at the age of five, and I've been at sea ever since. I'm the direct descendant of fishermen going back 150 years. Although born and raised in Husavik, Stefan, like many islanders, left to pursue his maritime studies. For years, he captained at sea, but always missed home. I needed to come back. My roots are here. I've always loved nature, fish, birds and whales. I can completely lose myself in it. Stefan realized that the natural beauty of his hometown and its wildlife was a great lure for visitors. I've always been attracted to the idea of working in tourism. He and his friends converted an old whaling boat and set sail. Today, people see it as newsworthy that we are shooting with cameras instead of guns. Gentle Giants is one of the many companies that ferry tourists from Husavik out to sea to view one of nature's most breathtaking sights. But the tide is turning 
on Iceland's ocean mammals. Breaking an international ban, the government recently sanctioned the return of whaling to Iceland's waters. Commercial whaling ships, moored up, are being given a new lease of life. It's legal once again to kill the remarkable creatures which the tourists come to watch. The decision to sanction whaling has been a controversial one. To Stefan, it makes little sense. Or we can make more money from watching whales than from killing them. Commercial hunts would generate just a fifth of the income of whale watching. But many Icelanders fiercely defend their right to hunt. It's an age-old tradition they believe should be upheld, despite international protest. This whaling that we used to do and that still goes on, I see this as a sort of political statement. The paradox of whale watching alongside whale hunting poses a dilemma for some tourists. If they stay away from Iceland in protest, it could spell disaster for Husavik. Ecotourism is one of the fastest growing industries in Iceland. But the money making season is short. With hardly any daily sunlight, tourists stay away in winter. And places like Husavik become ghost towns. To make ends meet, many locals are leaving for the city, where job prospects are better. It's a pattern being repeated all over the island. The population of Reykjavik has more than doubled in the last 50 years. If this exodus continues, towns like Husavik will simply fall off the map. The debate about Husavik's future sums up the crossroads Iceland is at. Icelanders must choose between an old and new way of life. It's the old ways that have seen them survive in one of the most volatile environments on Earth. But though remote, Iceland is no longer alone. Technology has brought the global community ever closer. And Icelanders are learning to communicate with it in their own distinct voice. In a land was love, no one was listening. Try my best to tell you how I feel. Somehow I'm sure, and this I believe in. This is real. From my heart, I sing to you. Dicta are an indie rock band in a thriving music scene. With a best-selling album and several Icelandic number ones to their name, Dicta are the sound of young Icelandic culture. Contemporary, confident, in tune with the world. Friends from childhood, Dicta got together in school. At the time, there were plenty of Icelandic artists making it big internationally. Björk and Sigurós opened doors for Icelandic music abroad. It's simply unbelievable that a country of 300,000 people can boast two such successful artists. Dicta are part of a new generation for whom city life is the norm. 
Reykjavik boasts one of the most vibrant music scenes in Europe. But even here, opportunities are limited. Even though we've sold a fair number of records, a gold disc for our most recent release, that isn't enough. Only a tiny number can make a living for music because the market's incredibly small. A gold disc is 5,000 copies. All the boys work full time outside of the band. There are two teachers, a pilot, and a doctor. If Dicta want to give up their day jobs, they must appeal to a wider audience. If you're looking to extend beyond the Icelandic market, which most people do, because the Icelandic market is so small, then it helps to sing in English, because it's an international language that most people understand. Many Icelanders are bilingual. English is the unofficial language of business here. But Icelandic has always been the language of the arts. Singing in English is a break with tradition and a response to a very new need to engage with the outside world. The media may be English, but the message speaks of Iceland. There's a common phrase we use. It'll work out. Just dive in and do something. We're just going to dive in. We're just going to do it. But do it well. And we're not going to think too much about it. Dicta's confidence is typical of Icelanders' approach to an ever-changing world. Isolated for years, they've developed a strong sense of self and the confidence to adapt in the face of change. This small, versatile nation has already positioned itself as a global player. Its fortunes, good, and bad now affect us all. But if the last decades have seen Iceland transformed, there are bigger challenges to come. For over a thousand years, Iceland's culture has been shaped by the volatile landscape. Now the islanders have the power to push back, to anticipate disaster, to bend nature to their will. But for how long? Once again, fishermen are the champions of Iceland's economy. But the seas aren't an endless resource. Industrialists are harnessing nature to create an alternative future. But even these reserves can dry up. As the world is warming, Iceland sits at a crossroads, searching for a sustainable path. Like never before, the world is watching. In so many ways, the fate of Europe's great wilderness matters to us all. Huge swathes of the interior are uninhabitable. But in an unforgiving landscape, 
Icelanders have learned to survive. Instead of farming the barren soil, they harvest the seas. Instead of escaping the wilderness, they're harnessing its power. For centuries, Iceland's physical isolation has shaped and protected its people. They've developed a unique and homogenous culture. Their language is as pure as that of their forefathers, the first Viking settlers. But Iceland's remoteness is no longer a barrier. The outside world has arrived, and it's a world in a state of flux. Economies are changing. Climates are warming. And energy is a commodity that everybody wants. In commerce and in culture, Iceland is already a global player. In a land's land, no one's listening. This far-flung island has the power to make an impact across the whole world. I'm sure in this I believe in. This is the path it chooses will affect us all. Oh my God, I'm losing it. I'm Tradition or progress. My senses tingle, I can hardly breathe. Nature or industry. The old ways or the new. Remote, beautiful, mysterious, unique. Islands are worlds of their own. Places apart, where life has evolved differently. But in our modern interconnected world, islands are also part of a global community that's changing, for better or worse. In this series, we're exploring the lives of islanders. We're discovering that no matter how distant they are from the mainland, how distinctive their histories, or how proud they are of their independence. Islands can't separate their futures from the fate of humanity as a whole. In so many ways, these shores are the front line of global change. What happens here matters to us all. In the middle of the North Atlantic, at the edge of the Arctic Circle, lies an island nation on the knife edge of the world. Iceland is one of the most volatile places on Earth. Made by volcanoes, spewing out molten rock over millions of years. The Earth is still active. The island is still being created. And living here is a unique challenge. A big country inhabited for more than 1,100 years. People have lived with eruptions and felt their effects. In Iceland, it's so common, people regard it as an everyday thing. Even by Icelandic standards, this eruption was extraordinary. The ash creates new soil, like this layer here. 
It was because the ash was so fine that it spread out so far across the Atlantic. Due to the combination of steam, explosions in the glacier and gas in the magma, the ash was much finer. That's why this eruption created so many problems. But the effects of this eruption pale in comparison to a cataclysmic explosion that happened here some 200 years ago. These are lava fields at Eltrian. The moss-covered lumps are scars left by the flow of molten rock. The lava spewed from La Cagiga, a tectonic fissure that erupted in 1783, creating one of the biggest volcanic events in history. For eight months, deadly ash and lava engulfed the island, killing a fifth of its population. The ash cloud spread far, plunging the world into darkness and famine. Icelanders still live under constant threat of more deadly eruptions. At least these days, they're better prepared. All movements within the island's volcanoes are monitored. At the first sign of unusual activity, residents are contacted by phone and evacuated to a safe location. Iceland is one of the least populated countries on Earth and one of the wildest. A geological hotspot. Iceland also straddles one of the world's most volatile geological features, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's a massive tectonic plate boundary, and it splits Iceland in half. As the tectonic plates pull Iceland apart, magma rises to fill the space. It's this volcanic activity that's forged Iceland's bedrock, and its construction is far from over. Today, the island boasts more than 100 volcanoes and more extreme geothermal activity than any country on Earth. Isolated from the outside world, Iceland's volatility usually goes unnoticed, until nature chooses to remind everyone of its awesome power. In April 2010, Iceland's Eyjafjallajökull yogurt volcano erupted, bringing Europe to a standstill. Worried that the volcanic ash would cause jet engines to fail, aviation authorities cancelled thousands of international flights. As the costs ran into billions of dollars, the world looked for an explanation. The eruption that took place here wasn't big, but it was serious, because it produced so much ash. Haroldur Sigurdsson is a world expert in volcanology, living in one of the most volcanically active regions on Earth. Iceland has been in... No one was killed during Eyjafjallajökull the Yogurt's recent eruptions. In the shadow of volcanoes, Icelanders have learned to survive. Though the country's interior is so barren, most Icelanders are forced to live on the edge, in coastal towns and cities. Reykjavik is home to nearly 40% of the population. The world's most northern national capital, the city gets just four hours of daily sunlight in winter and almost round-the-clock daylight in summer. 
Reykjavik's natural harbor is the cornerstone of its wealth, a commercial gateway and trading hub for the country's traditional produce. Fish is Iceland's superfood. It's the country's most lucrative export and the one resource that's enabled Icelanders to survive. Over a thousand years ago, when the Viking settlers first landed on Iceland's shores, the forbidding landscape loomed large. Long dark winters and poor quality soil made it impossible to farm the land. But nourished by the warm Gulf Stream, the fertile waters surrounding Iceland offered a lifeline. The early islanders came to depend on fish to sustain them. They still do. Today, less than 1% of the entire island is cultivated for crops. Fishing is still a major source of income and a way of life. Fly fishing is Christian Davidson's favorite pastime, but he spent his working life in commercial fishing. <laughs> 